I'd like to welcome you all to the first lesson of the third module of the course on Deep Learning sponsored by Eduonix. My name is Matthew Raymer, and I'm looking forward to guiding you through the virtual jungle, which is TensorFlow. TensorFlow is a machine learning framework which Google created and has used to design, build, and train deep learning models. You can use the TensorFlow library to do numerical computations, which in itself doesn't seem all too special, but these computations are done via use of data flow graphs. In these flow graphs, neural network nodes represent mathematical operations while the edges represent the data. It is usually tensors that are represented by a multidimensional data array that is communicated between these edges of a graph. The name TensorFlow itself is derived from the operations which neural networks perform on tensors. To understand tensors well, it's good to have some working knowledge of linear algebra and of vector calculus. Some more introduction is needed from me in order for you to grasp tensors properly so that you understand their use in machine learning. Vectors are special types of matrices. They are rectangular arrays of numbers. Because vectors are ordered collections of numbers, they are often shown in the form of column matrices. They have just one column and a certain number of rows. In other terms, you could also consider vectors as scalar magnitudes that have been given a direction. Remember, an example of a scalar is 5 meters or 60 meters per second, while a vector is, for example, 5 meters north or 60 meters per second east. The difference between these two is obviously that the vector has both a scalar attribute and a directional attribute. Nevertheless, these examples of vectors that you've seen up till now might seem far off from the vectors that you might meet when working with machine learning problems. Such a first impression is normal. The length of a mathematical vector is a pure number. It is an absolute. Note, a pure number is a number that has a dimensionless quality, which means it does not denote a physical unit. The direction, on the other hand, is relative. It is measured relative to some reference, the relation being expressed in direction and has units of radians or degrees. In regard to vectors, you usually assume that the direction of the vector is positive and in counterclockwise rotation from the reference direction. Visually, of course, you represent vectors as arrows. This means that you can consider vectors as represented by arrows that have direction and length. The direction is indicated by the arrow's head, while the length is indicated by the length of the arrow. Plane vectors are the most straightforward tensors. Tensors are much like those regular vectors which we have just described, the sole difference being that they find themselves in a vector space. To understand this better, let's start with an example. You have a vector having the dimensions 2 by 1. This means that the vector belongs to the set of real numbers that come paired two at a time. Or, stated differently, they are part of two space. In such cases, you can represent vectors on the coordinate x, y plane with arrows or rays. Working from this coordinate plane in a standard position where vectors have their endpoint at the origin 0, 0. You can derive the x coordinate by looking at the first row of the vector, while you'll find the y coordinate in the second row. Note that similarly, for vectors that are of size 3 by 1, you talk about the three dimensional space. You can represent the vector as a three-dimensional figure with arrows pointing to positions in the vector space. They are drawn on the standard x, y, and z axes. Expressing your vectors as unit vectors helps allow performance of operations. 
Unit vectors are vectors having a magnitude of 1. You'll often recognize the unit vector by a lowercase letter with a circumflex, or hat. Unit vectors will be useful to express a 2D or 3D vector as a sum of two or three orthogonal components, such as the sum of the x and y axes, or the z-axis. When expressing one vector, shall we say, as sums of components, you will be expressing component vectors, which are two or more vectors whose sum is that vector. You recall how we characterize vectors as being scalar magnitudes that have been given a direction. A tensor, then, is the mathematical representation of a physical entity that may be characterized by vectors. And just like a scalar value can be represented by a single number and a vector value with a sequence of three numbers in three-dimensional space, a tensor can be represented by an array of 3 to the r numbers in a three-dimensional space. The r in this notation represents the rank of the tensor. This means that the three-dimensional space, a second rank tensor, can be represented by 3 to the second power or 9 numbers. In an n-dimensional space, scalars will still require only one number while vectors will require n numbers and tensors will require n to the r numbers. This definition explains why you often hear that scalars are tensors of rank 0. They have no direction and are represented with one number. It's relatively easy to recognize scalars, vectors, and tensors and to set them apart what makes tensors unique is the combination of components and basis vectors. Basis vectors transform one way between reference frames and the components transform in such a way as to keep the combination between components and basis vectors the same. Essentially, tensors are just generalizations of scalars that have no indices. Vectors that have exactly one index, and matrices that have exactly two indices, and so one and up to any arbitrary number of indices. This generalization is important in machine learning since it can be used to carry, in a mathematical, geometrical fashion, probabilities for different features. Now that you know more about tensors, it's time we get started and install TensorFlow. Note, I'll be using TensorFlow 2.0 via Docker in my examples. Now that you have gone through the installation process, let's try a simple test to see whether it is installed properly. If I place that into a file named module30.py, I can execute the script like so. Just a little pedantic update. If you care about update warnings, you'll have to do it each time you run the image. We can fix the need to repeat those commands permanently by making a new image based on the TensorFlow base image, but we won't use our time for that. Finally, we run the Python file. If all goes well, you should not get any output from that. Let's try a light example before trying any heavy lifting. Module 3.1. First, import the TensorFlow library under the alias tf, then initialize x1 and x2 using tfconstant method, passing in arrays of four numbers. Next, you can use the multiply method to multiply your two variables. Store the result in the result variable. Lastly, print out the results with the help of the print function. Let's first take our time to explore and understand the data better before you start modeling this neural network, so that you can bring yourselves up to speed with the domain knowledge that you need to have to go any further with this lesson. We're going to be using a database of Belgian traffic signs, not Belgian waffles. Too bad. Belgian traffic signs are usually written in Dutch and French. This is good to know. But for the data set that you'll be working with, it's not too important. There are six categories of traffic sign in Belgium, 
warning, priority, prohibitory, mandatory, those related to parking and standing still on the road, and lastly, designatory. Now that you've gathered some more background information, it's time to download the data set here. Next to Belgium TS for classification cropped images, you will see a couple zip files. You should get the two zip files called Belgium TSC Training and Belgium TSC Testing. If you have downloaded the files, then take a look at the folder structure of the data. The testing, as well as the training data folders, contain 61 subfolders which are the 62 different types of traffic signs that you'll use for classification. Additionally, you'll find that the files have the file extension PPM or Portable PixMap Format. You have downloaded images of the traffic signs. Let's get started with importing their data into your workspace. Let's start with the lines of code that appear below the user defined function or UDF load data. First, set your root path. This path is the one at the place where you made the directory with your training and test data. Next, and with the help of the join function, you can add the specific paths to your root path. You store these two specific paths in train data directory and test data directory. You'll see that after having done this, you can now call the load data function and pass into it the train data directory. Note how the load data function itself starts off by gathering all the subdirectories that are present in the train data directory. It does so with the help of a technique called list comprehension, which is quite a natural way of constructing lists. List comprehension happens when you find something in the train data directory. You double check whether the item found there is a directory, in fact a subdirectory, and if it is one then you add it to your list. Remember that each subdirectory represents a label. Now you loop through the subdirectories, but first initialize two lists, labels, and images. Next, you gather the paths of the subdirectories and the file names of the images being stored in the subdirectories. You can then collect the data into the two lists using the help of the append function. Note that in the above code chunk, the training data and the testing data are located in folders named respectively training and testing. These two folders are both subdirectories of a larger directory named traffic signs. On a local machine, this having followed this procedure will give a result dot slash traffic signs with also two subfolders named training and testing. Now having your data loaded, you can begin a pretty simple analysis. Use the help of the NPRA's images in them and NP array images size, which are attributes of the images array. To do so might at first seem to you counterintuitive, but this is something you'll be getting used to as you go further. Most specifically, as you delve into working with images in machine learning or deep learning applications. Now you should take a small look at the labels, but you won't be seeing too many surprises at this point. These numbers are already giving you some insight into how successful your import has been and into the exact size of your data. You see that the size of the array is considerably big when you take into account the fact that you're dealing with arrays within arrays. Here's a tip for you. Try adding the following attributes to your arrays so as to get more information. Information about the memory layout, about the length of one array element in bytes, and about the total bytes consumed. Consumed by the array's elements, such as the flags, and the item size, and the in bytes attribute. This gets us set up and oriented to do some actual processing of a neural network in our next lesson. Until then, this is Matthew Raymer on behalf of Eduonics, signing off.